Hello, I'm Lee Morgan, and welcome to Spotlight on Mental Health. What is ADHD? Well, Dr. Morgan is with a very special guest today. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss this one. Well, welcome, Hervé LaBeouf. So good to see you. Today you're going to be talking about ADHD, and uh, you're a coach that deals with that kind of problem. So could you tell us more? People don't know enough about ADHD. Could you tell us? Yes, absolutely. ADHD, which is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, uh, is kind of a misnomer. The hyperactivity is not normally uh, carried into adulthood, uh, although adults do have ADHD, some percentage. Uh, it's an attention management disorder. We're not able to, and I have ADHD myself, mm. we're not able to easily, in the ways that other people manage uh, our impulse impulsiveness, or sometimes our inattentiveness, or sometimes even our hyperactivity. So this disorder, which carries over for, for many of us into adulthood, is something that causes, I guess you would say, 7%, let's say, of, or so of the population has ADHD. 93% of the people do not have ADHD. Well, those guys, even though they may have other problems, those guys are the ones who built the world wrote the uh, uh, tasks and instructions and wrote the uh, syllabi that the students are trying to follow, their brain is entirely different, or at mm -hmm. least in many ways different. Mm -hmm. People with ADHD have a little bit of an issue and end up working, their brain's working very hard uh, just to do the normal functions, unless they know how to accommodate. And that's, that's usually what is needed, is some way to manage these symptoms. Who says ADHD exists even? Well, the uh, American Medical Association, the uh, Pediatric Association, um, all of the medical associations actually around the world, the National Medical, recognize that it does exist. It is something that, uh, because it's only measured by behavior, and it can't be measured by oh, a blood test or, or something like that. And many people tend to think, well, I have ADHD too, and I should get extra accommodations and so on, because, golly, I lose my keys maybe twice a week. Mm -hmm. But people with ADHD have those symptoms that actually are consistent and repeated very much. Uh, somebody who loses their keys consistently every day or four or five times a week, uh, that may be a symptom that it's worth looking into to see whether you really do have ADHD. It's in the DSM-5, and I, being yes. a therapist, uh, looks at DSM-5, you probably do too. Yes. Uh, for a diagnosis, you have to put down the numbers from that particular uh, Bible right. uh, about what is a mental disorder, basically. So I know it's covered in there. Mm -hmm. uh, what about, you know, I've always thought that the families that I deal with that are so chaotic seem to produce kids with ADHD. And if only the family wasn't so chaotic, the kid wouldn't have this diagnosis. How, how would you address that? Well, I would say that, that the science seems to show that uh, ADHD is at least 70% inherited. Now, height, which is the next closest thing, was inherited about 65, 68% of the time. Uh -huh. So ADHD is even more of an inherited problem. It, it, they used to say, uh, we get it from our kids. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so if one of the parents has ADHD, it's going to be a little bit of a chaotic household, uh -huh. and the children who have ADHD, which is a physical thing, which is a change in the brain, 
uh, are likely to exhibit the same symptom because they're likely to have it. Well, you said that it, that it's a, a something in the brain. Could you do you see it on an MRI? Can you do a brain scan and see ADHD? No, actually, uh, the, the APA has looked at it very closely and decided that you can't take a picture of the brain uh, and or, or any of the, the things that you mentioned and see ADHD or a blood test even. Now there are many other things that you, you can't test by blood test or that mm -hmm. it's a behavior thing. So the, uh, the actual gold standard of diagnosis is to understand the person's behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's often done by sending questionnaires to teachers and co-workers and, mm -hmm. and people who are associating with the individual and then they would say yes this person is impulsive uh, three times a week this person and so on all of that's compiled and then it's also compared with symptoms of other kinds of conditions often people have 70 percent of people with ADHD have a co-occurring condition Mm -hmm. which could be anxiety, it could be depression, something like that. And it's, it's vital that in the, in the diagnosis, in the assessment, to understand what those co-occurring conditions are. Who can actually diagnose ADHD? Normally it would, take, it would be a therapist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, who actually has specific experience with ADHD. Because there's so many different uh, co-occurring conditions that could happen and different variations. You see one person with ADHD, you've seen one person with ADHD mm -hmm. because they're each different. So people come to you after they've already been diagnosed by some other professional, basically. That's correct. Uh -huh. okay. That's correct. And then you work with them. Uh, how does it affect family life, having ADHD? You can imagine that it would be <laughs> quite disruptive. If a person is inattentive, for example, they're likely to uh, not be ready to go when the family is ready to go, causes a problem, and it's consistent that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. I have heard stories of parents running upstairs to check on their, their young child, maybe three years old, with ADHD, five years old with ADHD, and they went up 20 minutes, upstairs 20 minutes ago to get ready uh, to go, and they, parent comes up and they're playing with their socks on the floor. Mm -hmm. And it's not because uh, they're fighting back at the parent. Uh -huh. It's because they got distracted and they didn't realize it and they didn't have that control. So parents would be complaining about certain things about That's their right. child and it could be that it's ADHD behavior really. Yes. Uh, and, and so then they have to deal with it in some way. How about a couple's relationship? That can be very difficult because a lot of times people with ADHD will commit to doing something, cutting the grass on a certain day or putting out the garbage, little things, uh, putting the dishes in the dishwasher, not the sink, those kinds of things. Well, we tend to be distracted. We might walk into the kitchen and decide to open the refrigerator instead of putting the, the dishes in the dishwasher. Yeah. And uh, we have a tendency to uh, really not remember these kinds of commitments. Uh -huh. That can be a problem in a marriage if one person, one person can be very type A right down the line and the other person has ADHD. And yet they're attracted to each other. They're different and they're, each one of them is interesting to the other and fascinating. And so that relationship can later become a problem if there's not an understanding of the two different brain types. Uh -huh. so why do some people have ADHD and others do not? Actually, because it's a difference in the brain. There's, if, if we're talking about, we'll talk about executive functions, and that's the functions we use to execute our life. Right. Those functions, which would be planning, organizing, managing, controlling, uh, controlling impulse, that kind of thing happens right up here in the prefrontal cortex, which is actually behind the forehead. Okay. Now, all through the brain, there are billions of little intersections that look something like that. There's a gap. The electricity or the signal comes this way, and it has to jump the gap and then go on. The way the brain works is those signals have to be sent to the appropriate places. 
Well, in order for that uh, signal to jump the gap, then there has to be a neurotransmitter in that space, either dopamine or serotonin uh -huh. or norepinephrine. In people with ADHD, it's not in there. It's not that place to the extent that's necessary to jump the gap. Uh -huh. So some people have that deficiency of the neurotransmitter, and some people don't. So uh, each brain is different. How does medication work then for the synapse? How does that, how does it help? Uh, well, the medication actually uh, provides that neurotransmitter. And you can get that neurotransmitter in a couple of ways. Serotonin, which is the, the feel-good neurotransmitter, if you will, if uh, some, some parents say if the son or, or daughter comes home from soccer practice, they've really got a lot of serotonin in their body and they can, they can really concentrate and do their homework for an hour and a half. It's just like taking medication. But after an hour and a half to two hours, then they're going back into the this, this normal state. Uh -huh. Whereas medication causes uh, dopamine to be released into the gap. And it's, uh, it's sort of a, uh, a way of causing that to become what other people would call normal. Well, this is, this is very effective, and then that part of the brain works very well. Uh -huh. What are the names of some medications that are typically used for this? Well, uh, there's the old bugaboo. People talk about Ritalin and Concerta, which is on one side. There are two major groups of medications. And we have 14 or 15 now. Oh, that, wow. Well, in 1930, when we first found that a medication helps with this kind of an issue, uh, they were only using one thing, and that was Dexedrine, uh -huh. which later on got a very bad reputation, if you will. Uh, so there's there's that Ritalin, Concerta, and then methylphenidate, and then on the other hand, there's Adderall. Adderall, which would include Vyvanse, which would include uh, short-acting, long-acting uh, types of that. And there are other medications that might have a component that helps with the anxiety, because very often a person will have anxiety along with the sure. ADHD, either yeah. as a separate uh, affliction, if you will, or caused by the ADHD. Uh -huh. if, if you're trying to get along in this world and, you, and you're doing the homework, but you're forgetting to bring it in, uh -huh. very frustrating, yes. and that can cause anxiety. Yeah. Are you allowed to write prescriptions for clients? No, no. That, that must be done by a doctor. And uh, the medications that are used are, uh, uh, I guess the difference is you need a DEA certification as well. Okay. Uh, because these, some of these medications can be misused. Uh -huh, okay. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I hear so many stories from parents over time about the very things you're talking about. And so, you know, these are behaviors that particularly tax the patients, patients of family members. Absolutely. You when know, they don't yes. know that the kid really has this, you know. There's something wrong with the kid. He's lazy. I've heard so many parents, well, he's lazy. You know, and that's not the case. He has some kind of special problem. And so, thank goodness it gets diagnosed so that, you know, you can work with it. Uh, how about, uh, what kind of professionals are capable of treating ADHD? Well, of course, the first one uh, would be the psychiatrist because they have uh, a full arsenal of tools, including the medication as well as uh, talk therapy and so on. And then psychologists, therapists uh, would be uh, working, say, on a weekly or, or so on basis. And then once the this client is beginning to understand what's going on and what what they need to do, uh, you can start working with a coach, an ADHD coach, which is actually a life coach, because yes. we're trying to help the individual learn to live their life with this difference in their brain. Uh, for example, uh, and it's very similar to a coach, let's say uh, you're, you're looking life at a football coach. coach. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. He has to get his players uh, and get a clear understanding of what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, 
and he has to determine whether, uh, for example, this person who's long and lean and runs really fast, uh, maybe he should be a running back and not on the line. Mm -hmm. So the coach with people with ADHD would be there to help determine where the person could be more successful and how they could be more successful. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more to your coaching practice and what's involved? Yes, yes, we, we generally, uh, somebody who has ADHD, they'll be referred to a coach, uh, often coming to me, and, and uh, we have an organization locally with that ADHD resource group of Northern Virginia. And so the person is referred, and then uh, they would meet with the coach and determine, I usually start with a free consultation uh, with the family, mm -hmm. and we talk about what ADHD is and what coaching is, and what kind of commitments involved on both sides, well, and are actually three sides with the parents, the client, uh -huh. and or the wife and the client, and, uh, and the coach. Then after that, uh, and that includes pretty clear demonstration and, and showing how ADHD acts in our lives. Then I start meeting with them once a week, and they'll come meet me at the office, usually at my office in Fairfax, although many coaches will go to homes, uh, many coaches will go to two or three different locations for people. Uh, then, and that is not just a weekly meeting, it's the weekly meeting and then during the week there's contact with the coach. We can do that by reminders, uh, some people send email or texts to the clients uh, reminding them that, hey, you said that you were going to do these things and and that's how you're going to accommodate, self-accommodate to the world that you're in. And reminding them to check off, yes, I've done those four things or those five things. And they might be, make sure that I actually have all the assignments. Uh, they might be, I understand uh, everything that my boss told me to do today, uh, and I've written it down. And then I have a way of handling the work so that I don't lose it before I turn it into the boss or turn it into the teacher. And as we go through these things, as they develop these habits, that's a self-accommodation. And it continues into, almost invariably, into very good success. Mm -hmm. They do very well. In school, they usually can give uh, accommodations in the school uh, schoolroom exactly. for these people. Yeah. Exactly. Some yeah. of those accommodations would be uh, when the teacher notices that the child is, uh, or the student is uh, inattentive, looking around, daydreaming, um, to go by and just tap the desk or do something that, that's not obvious to other people, that, hey, come on back, you're somewhere else, uh -huh. uh, all the way up to sitting in the front of the room so that you're able to uh, avoid the distractions happening behind you, or put the student in the back of the room uh, so that it can stand up, because we really have a need mm. for some kind of motion for our bodies. Uh -huh. And then uh, other ways would be for the teacher to check the assignment list that the student's bringing home and make sure they have the right assignment and they know when it's due and they know what they have to do. Uh, a lot of times teachers will put the assignment on the board, but they do it in the last 30 seconds of the class, mm -hmm. and that's difficult. Many teachers use uh, Blackboard, an online system, so that the kids can go into Blackboard, into uh, their portion of Blackboard, and they'll have the assignments there. Mm -hmm. I really wish that would be done by every teacher. It's you really work with needed. teachers as well? You yes. You get involved with teachers? We have classes for teachers to understand. Uh, I asked one teacher about when did they cover ADHD when they were in school learning to be a teacher, and she said, I I think that was a Thursday afternoon between two and three. Uh -huh, <laughs> yes. There's so much that teachers and, and even therapists and psychologists need to know, and it's such a broad, wide breadth of subjects that ADHD becomes one of, you can imagine, yeah. in your education, you had to go through so much and I had to learn so many things that it's, it's a specialty in itself. Invariably, they're going to have somebody in their classroom that has ADHD. Exactly. Yeah. And if, if we're talking about, uh, say, eight, ten percent, so in a 30-person classroom you'd have three 
on average, yes. <laughs> sometimes more. Yes. Uh, and, and the teacher then has other people with other kinds of learning difficulties. So it can be, it, it's, it's hard teaching with these children, oh, with, right. with all children nowadays, I think. Yes, right. <laughs> well, how did you come to be a coach? I think that's a great name for it because that's exactly what you're doing. It is a life coach helping them with executive functions in a way. And so how did you come to be in this field? Well, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, my sister was a psychologist, and when she, and I think her doctoral work was done in ADD at that time, Attention Deficit Disorder it was called, and she realized that our father had ADHD, uh, maybe poster child even <laughs> for ADHD, uh -huh. and it was very successful in the Army. Uh, and uh, retired as a, as a senior officer, uh, having gone in as an enlisted lowest level. Uh, then he, she looked at, at all, of, all of us, and we each have a different form of ADHD oh. and different amounts of it. Well, then she called me and told me about it, and, well, she's a younger sister, so who pays attention to a <laughs> kid's sister? About 10, 12 years later, I, I looked into it, and I realized... Oh, all these books about ADHD, they could be my life story. Mm, okay. and, and You've then, lived it. Pardon me? You've lived it. That's right. Yes, yes. I could have written a book, I think. Yes. So at, at that moment, then I started to look into what do I understand about ADHD and what can I do for myself to understand and maybe be helpful to my brother and sister. Well, uh, it looked to me then that no, I had a career as an electrical engineer, uh, an aviator in the Navy, uh, flying from uh, aircraft carriers, ships, and so on. And I looked back and I said, that's a lot of risk-taking, risk-seeking, if you will. Uh -huh. Also, one of the things that we see in ADHD, uh, because yes. we're, we're looking for something to uh, elevate our consciousness, if you will. Uh -huh. So that, and then uh, I ride a motorcycle. Uh, ah. you know, that, that raises the, you know, <laughs> like, so, the like police and firemen that's going exactly. more danger. That's yes. right. It's yeah. a little more danger. You, you easily, uh, I don't know what the percentages are, but I would expect that some percentage of firemen and policemen uh, in those kinds of very dangerous positions right. would have some. Yes. In, the, in the military services, we probably have uh, a recent study said about three times the uh, population uh, with ADHD that the regular, pop the normal population has. You know, we're in this field of working with people rather intensely. What have been, what's the biggest stress for you in working with this clientele? I think the biggest stress is realizing that if this person, and I'm thinking now of two or three or five particular people I've worked with over the years, if this person would just be willing to make a few changes in their life and help themselves, they would be so productive. They, m many of them have very high intelligence quotient. Uh -huh. and they, but at the same time, they have this distractibility, impulsiveness, and, and, and all of these things, hyperactivity that seem to keep going in their, in their life. And I think the stress is, uh, is it, is it something I can do to uh -huh. help them to make that change? Uh, is there some way to help them see it? You know, the coach doesn't, it's not a mentor, the coach doesn't tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. The coach helps you to find what works for you. So that would probably be the biggest stress. It's almost a regret for somebody that somehow didn't take care of themselves and achieve exactly. what they could have. It's kind of a regret when you see them or work with them. Uh, so, yeah, because you know that there's help. Well, you talked a lot about medication. What are the side effects of the medications that uh, are for ADHD? There can be, uh, well, every medication has side effects. Aspirin has side effects. So understanding that, side effects sometimes is uh, a lack of appetite because uh, the child would take the uh, medicine in the morning before they go to school, they're not hungry at lunch. So uh -huh. that can be a little bit of a problem. 
uh, you can't, they, some people will have physical uh, upset stomachs or headaches, usually lasts for maybe a week or two weeks, and then your body accustoms itself to it. Uh -huh. uh, I think those would probably be the biggest, and, and it's a revelation when the medication takes over, when the medication allows you to think in that way. Uh, some people oh. talk about, it makes me feel weird. Mm. Well, it makes you feel different from what you were before, and, and a student could say, gee, I got along so well, I had so many friends, because all these kinds of things, I, I'm the class clown, and, and everybody loves that. Uh, so I really don't want to take the medication. But mm. the, the side effects are minimal, can, can contrasted with the side effects of not taking the medication. If you could give one piece of advice to people that uh, might become your client, what would that be? One piece of advice. I would say learn everything that you can about ADHD, understand how it affects you personally, and then manage those symptoms. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us and explaining something that is somewhat mysterious to many people, uh, but that it really can be dealt with, it can be helped, and that you're, you're, you're doing that in your life's work right well, now. Thank you so much for having me, and it's just a, a pleasure to have this opportunity to tell people about ADHD. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's our show for this episode of Spotlight on Mental Health. Dr. Morgan and I want to wish you good mental health. We'll see you next time on this station.